my favorite thing to be in the house with people who are hungry for the Word of God. And one of the things that I have found, which I want to talk to you about tonight for just a little bit, is that me being a church girl, how many of y'all grew up in church? I grew up in church. Some of y'all probably born in church. I was a church girl, and so I spent a lot of my life thinking that the spiritual walk looked a certain way. And I was sorely disappointed when I left my parents' home and went off to college and realized that it wasn't going to be a lot of back-to-back -back experiences, that God had to walk with me in some dark places. And I had to wrestle with what it meant to walk in faith even when I felt like I was lost. And so tonight I want to encourage you with a very familiar passage in the book of Exodus. We're going to talk about what it means when the wilderness is his will. Because I can tell you right now, just by sheer statistics, I know when we go through our day-to-day -day lives, we don't always feel the high of the moment. We don't always feel the energy of the experience, but God is good. He's absolutely sovereign and he's in control. He is the God who never fails. He is Jehovah Roa, the God who sees. Jehovah Nisi, the one who goes before us as a banner. Shalom, who gives us a peace that we cannot understand. And so tonight I want to encourage you with just a few thoughts from the book of Exodus chapter 14. And I'm going to read a lot of these scriptures as I talk through it because I love to talk, but I don't want my word to supersede God's word. I want you to be able to leave this place and go find for yourself what he has to say for you in scripture. He's speaking to us, not just when we gather, not just when someone has the mic. Every time we go before God and open up the word and open up our ears, he is speaking. And so tonight I want to encourage you with Exodus chapter 14. And I'm just going to read uh, a little bit of that passage where God has set out to lead the people into the wilderness. Actually, in Exodus 13, 18, it says, God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And in skipping ahead in Exodus 14, 1 through 3, he says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Pia Hiroth between Migdal and the sea, and you shall camp in front of Baal Zephon opposite by the sea. Verse 3, here's the kicker. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, they are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. Here is what I want you to know as we walk into this passage. There's going to be times in your life where it feels like the wilderness has shut you in. You feel like you're in a desert place, in a dry place. Where is God? Can I tell you something? He hasn't moved. Just today, I decided to indulge in a little bit of shopping, and I went to the amazing mall that is not far away. I mean, the, the Lord was there at the mall, and I was praying for an anointing in my shopping, and was walking around the mall and decided to venture out on my own, and our beautiful hostess, Miriam, and our driver called my assistant at some point and said, oh, are you ready to be picked up? I said, yes. Okay, are you at the place we dropped you off? I said, no. And they said, where are you? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Somewhere at the mall. <laughs> and so if I was a little red dot moving, they'd be like, where are you? We're trying to find you. And so, y'all, I looked around, and I thought I followed the sign that said entrance 8, but then some food smelled really good, and I started following that smell. And I wanted to see what it was, and I think it was jerk chicken, and my husband's Jamaican, so something was stirring up in my spirit when I smelled that jerk chicken. And then I got lost, and I found myself outside of entrance 4, in a place I'd never been before. And so I'm on the phone with them and we're trying to navigate our way to each other. And so eventually I'm giving them landmarks and I'm walking, I'm moving. I think I know the general direction and they're giving me landmarks. And at first they were gonna try to find me and drive around to come meet me. But then they decided, let, let us just stay where we are so we can help you find us. 
And so there I am with my couple of little bags walking around the parking lot. And I eventually turned a couple of corners and went over a couple of hills and started telling them what I see. I see this, I see that. They were like, you're getting closer. Just keep coming this way. And eventually I saw them and they saw me coming across the hill and we found each other. And I was grateful for that. And I think about how funny it is that we found each other, but it wasn't because they moved. We found each other because I kept moving. That even when I felt lost, they knew exactly where I was. And had I just disconnected and tried to find it on my own, I might still be lost right now. But I stayed connected. I listened to the directions, and they helped me navigate my way to where they were. See, I think some of the problem is as believers, when we don't feel God in a certain way, when he's not showing up in a certain way, we think that he's moved. And so what happens is we stand still and try to demand that an almighty God come find us. And he says, I'm the unchanging God. I don't move. You need to move. If we've drifted, I need you to come closer. I need you to stay connected so that I can show you how to find me again. Seek the Lord and he will be found. See, the Christian life, ladies, is not passive. We don't stand in one spot and demand that God move just because we said something. God says, I am almighty God. You draw yourself to me. And so when you're in the wilderness place, are you able to connect with God, navigate your way back? Because God is an unmoving God, and even when he feels far away, we have to know that he is still there. The first truth that comes up in Exodus chapter 14 is that even when it feels like you're lost, you're not lost because God knows where you are. The children of Israel were experiencing something that many of us experience where you're like, why is God taking me the long way? Anybody ever been the long way? trying to find your way to something. And you're saying, God, but from A to B, that looks like the direct line. And God says, I know what I'm doing. And as a matter of fact, he took them the long way for a reason. He's saying, I want to deceive Pharaoh. Pharaoh will say they are wandering aimlessly in the land. Sometimes God takes you the long way because he is setting up a strategy against the enemy. He wants the enemy to think that you're wandering even though your steps are ordered. Because when the enemy thinks that you're wandering, the Lord is going to set him up for failure. And sometimes we're so busy trying to get out of the situation, pray the thing away, we're not asking God if there's a spiritual strategy behind it. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what everybody else feels. Lord, is this where you have me? Because sometimes God in his sovereignty will send us the long way. God is asking us to stay focused and look for his presence. Because even in the long way, you know what the scripture tells us? That there was still a cloud, a pillar of a cloud by day and a, and a pillar of fire by night. That they always had a reminder that God was there. And so even when the path doesn't seem like the one that you had set out for yourself, the Lord's hand is still there. Because your journey is not just for your own personal joy. It is also about dismantling the plans of the enemy on earth. And God may use your life in a way that is a part of a strategy bigger than you could ever comprehend. And only in our consistency and our seeking of God's presence will we understand that sometimes the long way is for the confusion of the enemy. It's not just so that your life is miserable. Every hard thing that happens to you, y'all, here's some news, is not the devil. There's a lot of hard things that happen to us and you trying to pray away and you trying to shut down the devil and God is like, that's me. I'm the one that sent you the long way. I'm the one that brought you into the wilderness. I'm the one that is calling you into this hard place. I'm the one who saw my son get baptized, have a dove descend, tell him I was well pleased, and the next thing I did was send him into the wilderness by the Spirit. Because everything in this life is not going to be the mountaintop. There's going to be valley places and wilderness places where God uses us in mighty ways. The question is, how will you respond in verse 10, it says, as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked back and the Egyptians were marching after them and they became frightened. 
So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Do you know that when you don't have a spiritual perspective, you will reduce divine activity to earthly understanding? Because God was doing something divine in their lives, and they said, oh, it must be because Israel, Egypt didn't have anywhere for us to be buried. They would actually consider that the deliverance that God had just brought them was not worthy of the wilderness. They were saying, I'd rather go back to what I knew, even though it was bondage, because the wilderness can feel so uncomfortable and can feel so unkind that you're wondering if maybe the Lord made a mistake. But even when it feels like you're lost, you're not. Because fear can make us foolish, y'all. It says they were frightened when they realized the way that God had taken them. See, fear makes us foolish. We start to consider going back to the thing that God has freed us from. Because fear will make you discount your deliverance. And you'll start to be so concerned, so disappointed, so discouraged with today that you will forget what God has set you free from. I don't know if you ever had that relationship. You don't have to raise your hand. You can just keep it in your heart. That relationship where you just knew this was the one. This is the one. This is my husband. And then for some reason, God in his grace allowed that thing to end. And then some years later, you saw that one you thought was the one. And you say, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord in heaven. Because I thought I knew what I wanted. And God knew better. And I will not sit here in my times of loneliness or when I'm discontent. I will not sit here and romanticize an unhealthy thing just because I haven't seen the next thing. I'm not going to look back and be tempted to dial that person back up because what will happen is because freedom is uncomfortable, we'd rather go back to the comfort of slavery than learn how to walk by faith in freedom. It's work to walk in freedom when your mind and your spirit are not used to it. God says, don't let the fear make you foolish and don't let the fear make you forgetful. In verse 12, it says, is this not the word we spoke to you in Egypt? The Israelites said, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. God, can you just send us back to the bondage? Because at least we knew how that was going to work. And if we're honest with ourselves, there's times we'd rather stay lost because at least when we're lost, we're familiar with it, it's comfortable. So we'd rather stay in the comfortable place that's foolish and unhealthy and toxic than to be in the difficult place, but it's free. When I was teaching my children about the history of, a sl of slavery in America, we talked about how hard it was and still is a lot of times for people who have slavery as a heritage to walk in certain kinds of freedom. We struggle with financial freedom. We struggle with some emotional freedoms. We struggle with some things because now for generations, we are trying to undo the bondage that a group of people were under. Because just because the, the jail cell has been open doesn't mean that you know how to walk in freedom. When you've been in bondage, when you've been stuck in something for years or even generations, depending on your family, don't think that just because God has set you free that you're going to know how to walk in that freedom. That takes work. That's why the Word of God says to put on these things, the fruit of the Spirit, things you have to walk in. Here's what it means. There's work, ladies. And so when the work gets hard then our minds will say, let's go back to the slavery because this freedom thing is too hard. This is exactly what the children of Israel were saying because fear makes us forgetful. It makes us forget what God has done. Sometimes when, I, when I'm needing something from the Lord, there's always a list of things that we're needing from the Lord. The truth is we don't linger long enough on when the Lord comes through. When the Lord says yes, when the, final, the Lord finally delivers and does the thing, we just go on to the next thing as opposed to saying, let me sit here in gratitude for my deliverance. Sometimes your frustration can be eased by just recounting all that God has already done. This is a room full of testimony. I know it's testimony in this room. 
And all of you look beautiful, but we all have a part of our story where you're like, if they knew. I'm talking about if your face is beat and your hair is laid and your outfit is tight, it don't matter. Your testimony is your testimony. And we spend so much energy trying to shine up the outside that we, we try to make ourselves forget what God has delivered us from. I want you to see me a certain way, and if I tell you my whole story, you might see me differently. But God is saying, because you can't even tell yourself the truth about what I've brought you through, you can't appreciate where you are today. So you're going through cycles. I'm going through the same patterns. God, I still need this from you. When we can just stop for a moment and say, where has the fear made me foolish, made me discount my deliverance? Where has the fear made me forgetful? So what David says, Lord, keep your works before me. Remind me of how you have come through for me. Because sometimes we live in this life, y'all, asking God for things like he has not already come through 1,026 times. We are desperate asking for God, asking God to do things, and it's not faith, it's fear. Because we refuse to remember that his resume is flawless that he's never failed, that he has always come through, that he has always protected, that he's always delivered, that he's always provided. So at some point, you have to ask yourself the question, how much of this is really faith and how much of this is fear? Am I wondering whether or not God is going to be God? He cannot help but be himself. We're worried about things that don't need to be worried about because the fear can make us foolish. It can make us forgetful. But in the midst of your fear, God has a charge for you. He says, keep fighting. And y'all say that? Say, keep fighting. Let me tell you what. In verse 13, it says, Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord. He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever forever. So even though the people responded with fear, God had a message. He said, you tell them, keep fighting. I need somebody to know that you don't have to actually be brave to do brave things, that you can be in the midst of your fear and still fight for the Lord, that you don't have to wait until every issue in your life is healed and redeemed before you can step out on righteous faith. See, the enemy wants you to think that you need to keep going through that checklist and he, you can't be used for that. Remember when you did that? Remember when you thought that? If they knew that, they wouldn't use you. And so we start to minimize our place in the army of the Lord because we're so focused on the voice of the enemy. And God is saying, even in the midst of your fear, I want you to fight. If you've ever been scared of something, if you're scared right now, you're wondering how God is going to turn your marriage or affect your children or keep you content while you're wanting to marry. By the way, if you want to be married, do I have single women in the room? Any single women in the house tonight? A few, it's like six single women in here? Come on now. Okay. So sometimes the, the, the enemy, the culture will speak to us and kind of stir up discontentment in our hearts. And we'll find ourselves stuck because we're so worried about some future not coming to pass that we can't walk in faith today. By the way, if you're single and you're ever discontent, just go to somebody's house that's married. If they tell you the truth, you'll be content. <laughs> if you're discontent, it's because the married people are lying to you. <laughs> When my single friends are get, start getting a burning about thinking they might make a wrong decision because that dude is not the right guy, and I'm like, think twice about it. I really want to be married. They had a timeline. They had a plan. They had an age, and now they're hitting the age. I'm like, come over. Just come over now. <laughs> come over while my kids are running and while this house looks like this and while we sitting here, you know, trying to work through the conflicts of life. And they leave, and they're like, I'm good. You know, I'm good for a little while. <laughs> If we just honest with each other, if we didn't put on facade with each other, we'd all be content. But the thing about it is when those things begin to stir in our hearts and they can create fear, they can create paralysis. Will I ever be this? Will I ever accomplish this? What will my life be like? God, will you use me? He says, even while you're yet working that out, you're able to fight. That every warrior on the battlefield is not completely healed, is not completely fixed, not completely perfect. That doesn't happen till heaven. We need to understand that we go to war while we're wounded. 
that we don't sit on the sidelines and wait until some perfect version of ourselves shows up, you'll never fight. And the enemy would rather have you on the sidelines waiting for some perfect idea of yourself than getting in the battle and doing your best just the way you are right now. God says, in the midst of your fear, I want you to fight because I want you to know that I'm fighting for you. I will accomplish for you today what I said. For the Egyptians, he said, who you have seen today, you will never see them again. Watch God work. He'll do it. He will do it even when it doesn't make sense. God will work. Verse 14, it says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Now, I don't know if that hit y'all like it hit me, but I, I'm not silent by nature. So some of us always got a word, always got a point to prove, always got an opinion to share. So that might be your word for the whole night, that the Lord actually works through my silence. He says, I'm going to keep, I'm going to fight for you while you keep silent. And it's not necessarily about physically not speaking, but he's saying, I need all of your activity to be subjected to mine. I don't want you to try to take the lead. I don't want you to try to manipulate my hand. I don't want you to try to speak things that I haven't spoken to you first. So if you follow direction, then you will see victory in the fight. Sometimes we get out on the battlefield and we're ready to fight. And as soon as we get out there, we've left the commander and we're going to do it our own way. And we find ourselves in the same situation, the same cycle over and over again. But the Lord says, I need you to submit yourself to the ultimate commander in chief. When you get on the battlefield, you still need to be dependent on my direction. You still need to call me. You still need to seek me. There is no strength and no strategy that you can muster up on your own that's going to be greater than the divine direction of God. When you're in the tough place, he says, I'll fight for you while you keep silent. I see this showing up in my kids. An illustration, a story just came up a few days ago with my kids. My son is 10 and he is the compassionate kind one. My daughter, I call her the spice of life. She is the spicy one, and she always has something to say. She always has to get the last word. And so a few days ago, I told her, I said, Chloe, you need to learn how to be obedient. When, when mommy says something, then that's the end of it. Once we've had our discussion, then that's the end, whatever the final word is. And my son is trying to help her out. He said, yeah, Chloe. You need to be quiet sometimes. Well, that started her up. And I said, Chloe, whatever this little treat is you wanted, whatever she wanted, time with a friend or whatever the thing was, I said, if you don't, if we have no back talk issues today, then maybe we'll think about it. But if you're going to keep talking, then we're not, you're not going to have this privilege. And so my son, who is 10 and she's six, so he thinks he has all the wisdom. He's trying to guide her in the ways of righteousness. And he's saying, listen, Chloe. These, this is how this can work for you, you know, but if you don't do this, mommy's not kidding. You really won't see your friends for a while. And so she got frustrated, but she got quiet. And she just said, okay, mommy. So she was quiet in the kitchen and I was cooking. And while I was cooking, I was texting one of her friends, mom, one of the mothers of her friends. And she wanted to have some time with this friend, a friend that goes to our church. And I said, hey, what, what's your Friday looking like? We're going back and forth, back and forth. I'm cooking. I'm texting her, y'all. I'm trying to work through the calendar. And while she's telling me when they're available to meet, then I'm trying to find another person that can hang with my son, see what my husband is doing. Like, in this little phone while I'm cooking dinner, a lot of logistics were being worked out so that my daughter could have this time. And she didn't think I was doing anything. And so finally, after about 15 minutes of silence, which to her was probably eternity, it was, but we got to take baby steps. She said, Mommy, I was quiet, and you still haven't done anything. <laughs> I said, first of all, dinner counts, even if you didn't know what I was doing on the phone. Can I just get y'all to be grateful for food? But I said, while you were sitting there doing your work, I was texting Avery's mom. 
And then Avery's mom told us when she could meet. And so then I had to text dad to see if he was going to hang with Joah. So I said, while you were sitting there, I was talking to four different people so that you and Avery can hang out tomorrow. But in your silence, I was working things out on your behalf. So even though it didn't look like it, because you can't see what I'm doing, things have been accomplished because you were able to close your mouth. You were able to trust me. You could not have worked it out on your own anyway. So silence really is your greatest weapon. And the Lord is saying sometimes we are doing too much and it's in your name and not in his name. And we're wondering why the results are not coming. He's saying there is a power in silence. It doesn't mean inactivity. It means submission. It's the kind of silence that Jesus had when he stood before Pilate, accused, and he said nothing. He said, it's as you say. It's the kind of silence that our Savior had on a cross when people accused him and mocked him. And all he said was, Father, forgive him. See, sometimes we get so excited about the weapons of our warfare that we forget that we have to be submissive. We have to have a posture in our hearts that say, God, I know you are working things out that I'll never be able to work out. There's going to come a point where God is going to say, I need you to trust me implicitly. And in your trusting, I will know when you've released that thing to me. Now, I'm not just talking about we wrote it in our journal or we shared it with a friend. I mean, I have really given that over to the Lord. My heart is silent on the matter. I trust that the Lord is fighting on my behalf. Am I able to do it? Do I feel like my busyness is a sign of my faith? Not always. The Lord says, while you are silent, I'll fight for you. While you're silent. He also tells us that in the midst of our fear, not only are we fighting and he is fighting for us, he challenges us to move forward. So there is this tension. There's a balance. Because in verse 15, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Okay, God, when I'm afraid, what do I do? Do I stand still or do I move forward? Do I keep silent or do I say something? He says, you do both. You're silent about your ideas and your plans and you move forward in mine. See, you can be in both places. He said, you have a list that you've given me. You have your vision board and your 2023 plan all worked out, and that's all fine and good. But at some point, you need to leave that over there on the desk, and I need you to walk forward in what I'm telling you right now. Because what I'm telling you right now didn't make the plan, or you didn't even know to ask for that. I'm telling you what you need to do right now in this season. So you stand silent in your plans. You move forward in the Lord's plans. You stand silent in your own ideas. You move forward in in the Lord's ideas. You stay silent in your agenda, and you move forward in the Lord's agenda. He said, you got to surrender some things. And I love your plans. I love vision planning. I love all that. We get a word for the year, and the Lord speaks to us, and it's amazing. But sometimes we get that word in December or January, and we never let it go. And God is saying, I might change course. I might shift. Are you still listening to me? I need you to learn how to release whatever it is that you've planned so that you can walk forward in what I've planned. And that is a constant release. If you're a planner in the room and you're like, Lord, we're on a timeline. There's things we're trying to do. The Lord will say, hold on. I'm not on a timeline. <laughs> you, you, you're on the timeline. I sit outside of time. And I know how the end is going to work itself out. Are you willing to say no? to self because it's not going to make sense. There's going to be relationships. There's going to be situations where everything and everyone around you is going to say, quit, give up, go a different direction. And the Lord is going to say, be still, fight. I'm going to call you to endure. I'm not going to give you the escape. I'm going to call you to endure. But look what happens when we do that, that God is setting everything up for his glory For his glory, y'all. Can y'all shout glory? Glory. Listen, we get so confused. I know what it's like to have the power of God leading you in your prayer time or in the things that you're asking. And God is saying, I want to say yes, but I want to know that if I say yes, I'm going to get the glory and not you. If I give you the promotion, if I give you the next thing, is it going to point back to me every time? 
Are you going to talk about me and my goodness and my glory? God says, everything I do is for my name's sake. I deliver the children of Israel for my name's sake. You're blessed because of it, but God doesn't exist for our blessing. God exists for his glory, and because his glory is so magnificent, when we give him glory, we end up blessed. But the goal is the glory of God. When he blesses us, when he delivers, when he sets us free, it's got to be something that doesn't just benefit me. Someone has to look at my life and say, I want to know that God. I want to know that Jesus. I want to be invited into what it is that you have. I don't just want to sit back and have people applaud my life. When I stand before the Father in heaven, all those things will mean nothing if they didn't bring more people into heaven. It's for my glory. Look what he says. In verse 4, he says, I will be honored through Pharaoh and his army. Verse 17, I will be honored again. Verse 18, the Egyptians will know that I am Lord when I am honored. The rescue is about reflecting the glory of God. The rescue is not just so you can be safe on the shore, which is what salvation means. It means to be rescued. But that rescue is so that you can reflect the glory of God. I had a friend of mine whose son almost drowned in a pool last summer. It was a horrible experience. He was a young swimmer, a beginner swimmer, had gone out too far, and this was not an area that had a lifeguard, and there was a person, an adult on the side that saw him kind of going up and down above the surface of the water, and he jumped out, swam out, got him. I mean, his kids were on the side of the pool. He just was like, hey, be still. I got to go save this boy, this 12-year-old boy. And he goes out there. He swims. The boy is fighting, as a lot of people do. He's in a panic because he's drowning. And so this man is trying to get him to calm down, and then they're trying to swim to sea and then uh, swim to the side of the pool. And then there were other teenage boys who didn't see what was happening. They were jumping off a diving board. So they hit the, hit the guy that was rescuing the boy. They both went under. I mean, it was a mess. This was like a 15-minute situation with the boy going up and down, trying to get him to the side of the pool. So he gets to the side of the pool. He's semi-conscious because now he's gone without oxygen for a while. They're trying to resuscitate him. Paramedics are there. And they finally are able to get him to choke up a lot of the water out of his lungs. And he starts breathing again. Now, now, let me tell you, when she tells that story, you cannot understand the weight of the story if she just says, my son was about to drown, and then he was at the side of the pool, and now he's saved. She cannot tell that story without describing the parent that left their own children on the side of the pool who swam out into the deep end to get her son and bring him back to safety and had to endure all the distractions that were happening in this pool to get him to the side and keep him alive until the paramedics got there. She can't tell that story without talking about the one who did the rescuing. That's exactly what happens in our lives. We talk about our testimony and we forget to brag about the God that did the rescuing. He says, it's not that you were drowning and suddenly miraculously appeared on the side. I was the one who left my son so I could come and save you and bring you to the side safely so you might have a life that you would not have had otherwise. The rescuing has to be about his glory. It cannot just be that you were miraculously delivered. It has to be bragging about the God who would leave his own son, send him to earth, allow him to be fully human, strip him of some of his glory, but keeping all of his power, call him to live a righteous life, to walk miraculously in perfection, in humility, in servanthood on this earth, to deal with accusations, betrayal, to deal with abandonment, rejection in his own hometown, to know that he was king, could call down angels and chose not to, to find himself on a cross dying a death he did not deserve, only to be resurrected three days later with a power that he didn't even keep to himself, but he gave to every person who chose to believe. He said, if you're not telling that story when you're talking about your rescue, then what are you saying? Where do I get the glory from it? When people walk away, are they impressed with you or are they impressed with God? Are they wondering about your life or are they wondering how God needs to be in their life? See, there's a reorientation because this culture is very much about self-fame. This culture is like, make yourself great. 
Promote yourself. Be your own brand. Do all of these things for you. You are a God unto yourself. You might not ever say that word, but this culture wants you to worship yourself. And it is enticing. And we will start to mix up the idolizing of ourselves and call it the blessing of God. And he said, it's only a blessing for me if it glorifies me. I need you to understand that the devil can bring good opportunities too. I need you to understand that the enemy can give you high paying jobs too. Does it glorify me? And nobody's going to applaud you. They're not going to be like, it's so amazing that you glorify God. It's so great that you honor Christ in everything you do. That's going to be a decision that you have to make. But God is reminding us here that the purpose of the rescue is about reflecting his glory. Even the enemy will give God glory when we live for him the way that we should. Verse 24 says, at the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. <laughs> he caused their chariot wheels to swerve. He made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel for the Lord is fighting for them against us. The Egyptians the enemy eventually said, let us leave this people alone because their God is fighting for them. Even when the enemy doesn't want to, when we live our lives in such a submitted way to the Lord's plan, they cannot help but give him glory. They cannot help but honor God for who he is. They cannot help but see that everything is for his name's sake. That every good and perfect thing that comes to us is for the glory of God. That every gift, that every blessing is so that his name might be made great in the earth. That people would walk away desperate for a God who says, come to me if you're weary and you're heavy laden. I'll give you rest. God's work in the wilderness should cause you to worship. Y'all, that's where the good worship comes from. Now, the worship, when everything is going great, it's good. But listen, when you're in the hard place and God is still coming through, that's the worship that will lay you out. If we're honest with ourselves, when we think about those times we've been closest to the Lord, it was not the mountaintop. It was in the valley place. And you're like, oh, my God, you are good. You are faithful. You are still present. It is in the hard places, the wilderness places, that sometimes our most genuine and authentic and life-changing worship can happen. In Ephesians 15, after they have been delivered, it says, Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I'll sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Now, that's worship. Worship that honors God and shares your testimony. Because I can tell you this, what this world needs is a God who is still good, even when life doesn't feel good. If we're only promoting God after we close on the house and get the job or get engaged, then the world will think that God is only good when life's blessings are going our way. But most of your friends and most of this world are not in the blessed place. They're in the hard place. And they don't know what God they can turn to because we're afraid to show them who God is even before he says yes. When we're in the wilderness that God is faithful. When we're in the hard place that God is worthy of praise. In the hard place, God is good. Y'all, he cannot help but be good. The goodness of God is not about how God acts. It is about God's attribute. He cannot help but be good. He, he cannot cause himself to do anything that's not good. He cannot help but be faithful. He cannot help but be loving. He cannot help but be kind. There is a testimony. And I want to encourage us tonight to do this. Tell the whole story. That's the only thing. Can y'all say that? Tell the whole story. Tell the whole story, y'all. The highlights don't help nobody. 
It's the hard places where people can see that you're still standing and life wasn't perfect. That the thing that should have taken you out, somehow the Lord preserved your mind. That the past that should have disqualified you, somehow God has still called you. That even when you had unforgiveness, you had hurt in your heart, somehow God healed you. That the things that you weren't even qualified for, somehow God promoted you. That the things you know you didn't even do right, God still gave to you what you didn't deserve. That even when you weren't always a good friend, God was faithful to you. That even when you had an anger in your heart, God gave, gave you peace. It is in those hard places, in all of our flaws, all of our imperfections, the wilderness place that we get to see that God is still worthy of worship. And the world around us is living in a wilderness. And God has called this people to show them that in the hardest of places, God is still good. That in the hardest of places, God is still faithful. That even when there's things you want from him, he still has already provided. Even in our fear that he's still a protector. This is the commitment of the believer. And my encouragement for you to tell the whole story. Tell the whole story. Because in that, God will receive glory. And there will be a reason for that rescue that not only changes your life, but changes the world that you've been called to change. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your kindness, for the places you've called us to step out and we've been too scared to move. When we've been disobedient, even though everybody didn't know about it, when we've dealt with imperfections and struggles in our own lives and you still remain faithful, you still have calling and assignment over our lives, you still have expectation from us that you don't disqualify us even if you have to discipline for a while, that you still call us to do battle, you still call us to speak into this culture, to be changers in this world. Father, I pray tonight for freedom. Just freedom, God. And not, not just freedom from our struggles, but freedom from our story, God, that we can tell the whole story and believe that you will be glorified. Would you elevate us over embarrassment? Elevate us over reputation. Elevate us over fear of not being popular or accepted. God, would you remind us that one day we will face you and the well done will not be the applause of this world. It will be the acceptance of a savior based on our obedience. So God, when we leave this place, would you just realign our hearts that even with all the things we are yet to ask or all the things we think we want from you, would we celebrate what we already have? And that's a testimony, a story to tell that brings glory to our God. Would you remind us that in the end, the word of God says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Help us to tell the whole story, God. It's all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give it up for the ministration of Pastor Jada 